Hey there everybody, AJ back again for the Mighty Glustic channel. Skipping ahead a little bit in my series on dragons due to the large number of requests that I talk about Tiamat. Dungeons and Dragons draws on a very diverse range of material to create settings and narrative elements. Tiamat is drawn directly from the ancient Sumerian and Babylonian mythology. Tiamat was the goddess of the sea, the briny sea, represented as both a humanoid female figure and as a great dragon. She mated with Abzu, god of fresh water. The Sumerians and Akkadians believed fresh water was all drawn up from beneath the world and Kur, the underworld. Anyway, Tiamat uh, mothered the pantheon of younger gods. These children murdered Apsu in order to up usurp his lordship of the universe. Enraged, Tiamat gave birth to the first dragons, filling their bodies with venom instead of blood. Went to war against her treacherous children only to be slain by Marduk, the god of storms, who then forms the heavens and earth and other things from her corpse. Tiamat has been part of Dungeons and Dragons from the very first supplement of Greyhawk in 1975, although at the time she was simply called the Chromatic Dragon or the Dragon Queen. She was in the form she has appeared in consistently throughout all of D&D history, which in itself is a testament to how iconic a figure she is. She gets further de uh, described and named Tiamat in the first edition Monster Manual, and here is her stat block from Dragon Magazine, or The Dragon, number 38. She is already listed as a devil, and this gets a further development uh, in Ed Greenwood's article in Dragon nine, uh, number 75, and later the Manual of the Plains. Basically, she is a constant staple in the background of Dungeons & Dragons lore, right up to the very first uh, adventure books published for 5th edition, which focus on the cult of the dragon's efforts to free Tiamat from the Nine Hells and bring her to the Material Plane. Tiamat is not only a primary god of the Draconic Pantheon, she is a god, one of the very first to have aspects or lesser avatars. She is effectively immortal and while she can be killed physically, and has been many times, she will simply reform and manifest again and again after a period of time where her divine essence leaves that plane of existence and then reforms, refreshed and rejuvenated. One reason for this is that Io, the dragon created deity, split his essence, his personality, into different parts to create the draconic pantheon. Bahamut and Tiamat have always been the most non-draconic, uh, had the most non-draconic worshippers, though, and are thus the most widely known. As a god, Tiamat can see, hear, touch, and smell at a distance of 10 miles. In addition, she can see the invisible and ethereal, key, ethereal creatures. If she chooses, she can perceive anything within 10 miles of her worshippers, holy sites, objects, or any location where one of her titles or name was spoken in the last hour. Tiamat can understand, speak, and read all languages and speak directly to all beings within 10 miles, teleport at will and at any time she likes. She can mimic any voice or sound she's heard. She can also breathe underwater indefinitely. Though as a deity, she doesn't really need to breathe or eat. She can freely use her breath weapons, spells, and other abilities while submerged or in other planes of existence. Tiamat has the ability to corrupt water. This ability causes water to become stagnant, foul, inert, and unable to support animal life. The ability can also spoil magic potions, any other liquid containing water. She can also charm reptiles, uh, this is the scaly folk power, can communi communicate with any reptiles she has charmed, and she can extend her senses to up to five different locations at once uh, due to her five heads, more on this later, and block the sensing power of deities with power equal or less than hers. She can sense anything that affects the welfare of chromatic dragons so long as the event in question affects at least 500 dragons. She appears often as a dark-haired woman, a sorceress. Uh, this is as much her true form as her iconic five-headed dragon form. She has the head of uh, red, blue, white, green, and black. Her tail is similar to a wyvern and equipped with a wicked poison stinger. Her body is proportionately wider, broader uh, than normal for a colossal dragon and is a blending of various chromatic forms with an appropriately multicolored hide. Stripes of different colors are spaced down the length of her spine and tail and her wings darken toward the edges. While she is often depicted as having the body of a red dragon, this is just a manifestation of one of her aspects the cartoony one, shall we say, uh, of which she has several at any one time. Bit of history involved there, some really nasty tricks she's used in combat using a, um, that she can use in a different, unique way. More on that in a moment. Uh, two important notes. One is that, as mentioned, Tiamat, can, Tiamat cannot be truly destroyed by anything other than a greater god. That is the law of the overgod Ao. Basically, Tiamat is required to exist. 
bottom line buck stops there Tiamat can be in prison though now at some point Tiamat did not have such a terrible relationship with her brother Bahamut but eventually the love hate sort of just became hate hate and now well she loves to hate him but they both have been alive for a very very long time thousands and thousands of years a lot has gone on a lot has changed and they have spent centuries involving themselves with various events creating plots and schemes to just to amuse themselves these often play off against each other culminating in this place um, all that turning into a grand staging area for the latest conflict a flare-up in an old eternal cold war between the two where some point of um, some sort of point scoring that they only, uh, they only understand themselves is going on Tiamat um, as a great god has many gods that rank below her she is ultimately in charge of their portfolio um, and her own if they include evil dragons evil reptiles conquest greed uh, her domains cover destruction dragons evil greed hatred law scaly crime trickery tyranny she is the, uh, is the mother of all chromatic dragons she also creates dragon spawn um, these spawn creatures crop up frequently and her offspring born of her five dragon consort are almost always legendary dragons in their own right she usually has five consorts with her they're all adult male chromatic dragons one red one blue uh, one white one black and one green all in peak condition and exemplary examples of their species fanatically loyal to the queen and mate in combat Tiamat has a couple of unique tricks she plays one is to cast mirror image and have all of her consorts transform into versions of herself they usually have uh, their, their usual hit points they can use their breath weapons the usual amount of times um, however they can bite five times per round just like she can they can also cast spells that will fire off draconic magic and the player characters well a lot of draconic magic the player characters have never heard of as will Tiamat for example one dragon casts a spell the other one uses the breath weapon and the energy of the breath weapon condenses in media and transforms into a breath weapon golem that moves around independently and attacks with blasting slam attacks for that energy type they can also grapple searing victims with that energy damage they can just like Tiamat turn ethereal at will this is their consorts and they can travel into the astral plane they can use scrolls wondrous items artifact items potions and other minions to change uh, cause the minions to change their tactics and just order them around on the battlefield freeing Tiamat to concentrate on five other things at once Tiamat is also the f uh, former lord of Avernus the first layer of hell actually she just lost interest in dominating the entire first layer of the nine hells it's no doubt more complicated than that but basically this was a deliberate decision by Gary Kygax to remove the majority of non-devils from the Nine Hells as of Dragon number 75 in 1983 she was still the ruler of Avernus so I'm not sure whether that co-aligns with the creation of that monster manual uh, she has her own domain there at any rate you can say um, you could say this Tiamat rules wherever she physically is <laughs> and the rest of the layer of Avernus is in a default state of hiding from Tiamat when she shows up all political concerns are shelved in favor of just surviving the situation at hand Tiamat has always had the favor of Asmodeus he grants her and her consorts the authority to great gate in greater devils wherever they are she can call in four barbed devils or three boned devils and will most likely do so right at the start of combat in the nine hells she has the permanent service of three infernal nobles who served him at and command her armies in Avernus. Malthus leads 40 companies of Abishai. Uh, Amduke, um, Amduskius leads 29 armies of Abishai, and Goap leads three elite companies of Rurinis, the special forces of hell. Just a quick note on the Abishai, I had a recent request to talk about them specifically, so here you go. Abishai are devils with draconic essence they are bred a breed created by Tiamat and the infernal duke a member of the dark eight Pierza. Uh, Abishai were first created uh, first featured in an article by Gary Gygax in dragon magazine number 75 they come in various colors of uh, chromatic dragons so yes there are gray purple and yellow versions as well as the usual red blue green white and black many subbreeds exist though as Abishai are devils thus they can progress in rank and form through the service to their masters as is the way the law you could say of the nine hells the majority of Abishai have gone on to serve other masters and you can encounter them just about anywhere short of the uh, celestial planes some are much more 
powerful than they were when they were created by Tiamat in the first place. Many of the original Abishai reside in the domain of Tiamat, the dragon spawn pits of Azharu, or in her uh, fortress Tetherian. They serve as messengers, guardians, uh, tempters, and heralds, always working wherever they are to sow the seeds of avarice. All Abishai follow the same general body shape, and as with chromatic dragons, their colour is related to their overall personality. This never really alters a whole lot. They appear as bipedal humanoids with large leathery wings and a short tail that ends in a stinger. Oh, sorry, a long, thin tail that ends in a stinger. It is said that wherever Th- Tiamat has interest, Abishai are bound to be nearby, lurking and spying for their queen. Black Abishai are known as Rack Abishai, spitting blinding acid and have shadow melding powers, kind of the ninjas. Venomous green Abishai have a charming gaze and an intoxicating toxic cloud breath that they can very adept at moving around in and ambushing foes within the toxic cloud. The blue storm Abishai will electrocute anyone who hits them with a melee attack and blast thunder and lightning in stunning bursts. They prefer to drop from the sky like a little bolt of lightning. Inferno Abishai have the power to emanate flames in an aura and prefer to wade into combat in a fury of claws and a stinger that injects well, napalm, basically. They all have regeneration, low light vision, flight, resistance to their inherent energy type, and so on. The black and blue are physically not as powerful as the green and white, and the red is the most fearsome, tough opponent by far. They tend to do well in the Nine Hells, and thus thrive in that environment. They actually have a favoured weapon. Uh, the black Abishai use halberds, white f- use flails, red use long daggers, green use uh, guizam vulgers, and the blue use tridents. They can all use spell-like powers. As a standard action, they can cast Alter Self, uh, Command, Firebolt, Prestidigitation, and Summon another Abishai. And they can also use Scare, which is basically a single target wisdom save to negate magical compulsion to run away from the Abishai for up to a minute. When not otherwise engaged with the tasks for their master, the Abishai enjoy leisurely flights over the fire chasms, betting on training fights between bearded devils and monstrous foes, I like to imagine that Tiamat occasionally amuses herself by going and finding the largest, biggest, meanest creatures that she can find in all of the realms, capturing one alive and transporting it to the uh, the plane of Avernus just for training fights against uh, her the, the other forces of devils. Um, Abishai also amuse themselves by torturing other creatures. They really like torture. It's like their main hobby. Tiamat has made so many creatures, there is a reason she is called the Mother of Dragons. Her spawn are a whole subcategory of monsters worthy of their own video, uh, just to save some time here. She is also responsible for the murder of a lot of them as well, and is not above executing and absorbing the power of the greatest dragons and other deities. In fact, she has been killing and absorbing the power of other gods from the moment she was born. When Io uh, created his dragon children, Tiamat killed Voril, her older brother, tried to frame Bahamut for it, and Io, along with Paylor, banished her from the Nine Hells. So, uh, banished her to the Nine Hells. So this is one reason she and Asmodeus get along so well. They have this kind of share of fall from grace experience. Tiamat as a god exists across multiple planes of existence. She is uh, Tarkesis of the world of Kryn. She is the god of the Untheric Pantheon on Abiatoral, the last of the Untheric gods. She is the bound demon lord of um, Eberron, in prison in the Pit of Sorrows in Argonism. Um, her cults are spread across many worlds. In the Forgotten Realms, they are outlined and updated very well in the Horde of the Dragon Queen and Rise of Tiamat adventure modules for 5th edition. The cult of the dragon is more of a general faith. The Church of Tiamat is a rarer breed. Although all dragons know of Tiamat, and all chromatics pay all due respect to her, not many dragons could be regarded as full priests of Tiamat. A few of the other species would um, few other species would even dare to take on the mantle of her clergy. Those that do are known as worm lords or worm keepers, and they have a, tri- a strict hierarchy they follow, moving up the ranks and dominating those below them, with all sorts of laws and rules to be followed, characteristic of a devilish, nine hellsy, lawful evil type of religion. Tiamat's draconic priests may attempt to spread the worship of the Dark Lady to uh, local humanoid and uh, not demi-human populations. They find what inspires greed, avarice, jealousy, and pride in them, and grow the church around it. Eventually, the congregation will be acting very much like dragons, spending a lot of time idle, gorging on feasts, slumbering, contemplating their wealth, plotting the destruction of rivals, fighting amongst themselves and with their rivals or any interlopers, 
sacrificing wealth to the Dark Lady in exchange for blessings. A priest of Tiamat will never do anything for free, never forgets an offence or slight, and will work out a way to acquire everything you own, preferably leaving you in some sort of debt to them, payable in servitude. The two most important daily ceremonies are the tithing and the rite of respect. Tithing involves cupping about 25 to 100 gold pieces in the hands or claws and offering it to the goddess. If it disappears, which it does about 10% of the time, then the ritual conveys a blessing state um, that lasts until the next long rest. So it's basically identical to the spell. The rite of respect is performed by non-dragons and it is a complicated ceremony of, ceremony of kowtowing in the presence of a dragon or other spawn of Tiamat. Within reason, it serves nobody to get yourself ripped apart and eaten for no good reason. Evil dragons celebrate great victories by torturing prisoners and committing other atrocities in Tiamat's name. Tiamat doesn't really care who provides her with additional power via worship, but when she does manifest on the material plane, she cares only for the ascendancy of chromatic dragons and the destruction of metallic dragons. All other creatures are food and slaves. Tiamat is arguably the most formidable opponent it is possible to face in combat, in my opinion. She is resistant to all cold, fire, thunder, lightning, acid and poison attacks. You'll need a magical weapon of at least plus two to harm her, and the uh, weapon would do, do, would do double damage if it's also silver. She's vulnerable to magical force, such as magic missile. She can be poisoned if she happens to fail a saving throw, if she chooses to fail a saving throw. She is subject to the same sort of vulnerabilities as other devils, so in theory she could be banished back to Avernus. She is always accompanied by her five consorts, um, has all sorts of fiendish minions. She has an arsenal of magical artifacts, including unique draconic artifacts. She has forgotten more spells than currently exist in the player's handbook. Each of her heads can cast a can use a breath weapon each round or cast a spell each round. She can talk through any one of them and is particularly difficult to um, decapitate any one of her heads. It can be done though. It is a subject of some debate if her heads are truly independent personalities or if they just form part of a collective consciousness. From the available lore, I would say that they can operate independently, focus on different tasks, cast spells and attack different targets, even have individual conversations. However, they all have the same mind. It is just that um, one will focus on... It's, it's, so her personality focuses on five different things at once, as a constant. This is not actually unusual for a god at all. Greater gods can focus on hundreds of things at once across multiple dimensions. So she has five points of focus. Her heads are not separate beings. They never argue. They merely talk to themselves from time to time, just as he we have conversations in mirrors with ourselves from time to time. Tiamat doesn't have a split personality, nor do her, head, her heads have any real need for different names. I've looked high and low to find the answer to that question, and as far as I know, the heads are known as black, red, white, blue, and green. Interestingly though, each head does contribute to her overall personality, so her cunning is largely handled by her green head, as far as I know. Or perhaps it just has an aptitude for it, like we would have um, a left or right-handedness, I don't know. It is a, If it's appropriate for your story, however, you have every right to play the multiple heads however you choose. If there is um, some need for there to be a chance that the players can trick a head into arguing with another one, by all means, make it a thing. This would be fine with Gary Gygax or Ed Greenwood, and it's certainly fine by me. Your game, your way. It's not going to impact another person's playing their game, their way. So have at it. Tiamat's unholy symbol is the five heads um, of different dragon kind, a five-rayed star with different colors. Um, kind of like, looks like a throwing star. Tiamat is very tricky. She often takes on the guise of another deity or powerful being in order to play her games, set up her contests with Bahamut, thwart his plans, manipulate events, and just amuse herself. The Dark Lady can be encountered anywhere. You may even run into a powerful sorceress and her five companions uh, without having any clue, you just stood in the presence of an avatar of Tiamat. In her true form, if it was ever unleashed on the prime material plane, again, she will devastate whole nations with tremendous violence, exacting her revenge for all of her grudges. She will systematically hunt down and murder every metallic dragon, causing a mass exodus of any remaining to the outer planes and demi-planes of the ethereal and astral realms, to the Feywild and Shadowfell. 
Her reign will usher in a dark age of evil draconic domination and utter subjugation of non-draconic beings. This may very well lead the path open to the inevitable ascension of the Illithid Empire, because everyone else who stood before them is now gone, out of the way. Who knows? Let's hope that's not anytime soon. Or hey, maybe you feel like running a campaign in a world where such a calamity has come to pass. Up to you. Anyway, that's a basic overview of TMAT. There are many more details I could have crammed in here, such as the origin of uh, Kirtlemark, the uh, kobolds, the kobold god. Um, they are all available for you to peruse in the Forgotten Realms wiki pages or Wikipedia, and there's a lot more info for the various uh, campaign settings. But for now, thank you very much for your time and attention. I look forward, as always, to your comments down below. Thanks for listening, everyone. I'll catch you again soon.